Hello everyone, my name is Sue Shardlow. I'm the Developer Community Manager here at Redis. Thanks so much for joining us today. Today we've got a little fireside chat with me and Lance Leonard, who is our documentation team manager. And it's all part of our Hacktoberfest series. So if any of you are wondering what Hacktoberfest is, don't worry, you do actually still have two days left to take part. Hacktoberfest is an annual festival of open source, it takes place every October and it's in its eighth year now. It's kindly sponsored by DigitalOcean. So if you go along to the um, developer.redis.com slash Hacktoberfest, Web page you can read all about that. It's basically a festival to celebrate open source and help people to get involved quite often for the first time. And there are a number of different ways you can get involved in open source. You can contribute to your favorite um, code base, your favorite piece of software. If they are open source, you can add some enhancements to that. But a lot of people find that scary and it is scary for a number of reasons. Like, you know, you might feel that you're, you're not confident enough to do that or you don't know the language or you, you don't know where to start you don't know how to find an issue to work on so a lot of people say that documentation is a good way to get started with open source and that's why i put together a series of events to talk about documentation and technical writing because i think that technical writing in itself is a bit of a mystery to a lot of people even though they might be in tech and I know that there are many people, so whether they're software engineers or they don't work in the tech industry currently, or maybe you work in tech and you're not necessarily a coder, that are wondering if technical writing is a career that they could do. And what I aim to do through this series of events is speak to my colleagues in the Redis documentation team to demystify this for you. Now, they have all come from a range of different backgrounds. So hopefully that gives you a bit of inspiration um to know that you could get into technical writing almost regardless of the background that you came from because technical writing is a skill that you can learn and develop so what i've done so far is a couple of weeks ago i did a little panel fireside here on twitch and the recordings up on youtube with the whole documentation team where i just talked to them generally about documentation technical writing and very briefly about uh, their backgrounds and then what I've done this week is I've taken all three of them and done a one-to-one -one fireside chat with each of the people in the team. So I had Caitlin on Monday, Rachel on Tuesday, and today I've got Lance to go into more depth about their background and what their particular role involves or what their careers look like so far and all of that good stuff, what skills they brought to the party and what skills they've had to pick up because they all had different backgrounds. I mean, Rachel was a software engineer before she became a technical writer. Caitlin was not a software engineer before she became a technical writer, so completely different start in the whole realm. Uh, but yet now they're doing a similar role. So all really interesting. So yes, like I said, this is uh, the fourth in the series, the fourth and final segment of this documentation series for Hacktoberfest at Redis. You'll find the recordings for the panel fireside, the one-to-one -one that I had with Caitlin and the one-to-one -one that I had with Rachel on our YouTube channel. You'll also find the recording of this here, one-to-one -one fireside that I'm having with Lance today on our YouTube channel, some hours in the future from now. So we will get that on YouTube as soon as we can. If you subscribe to us on there, then you will get a notification when that video has been uploaded. And we'll also probably premiere it so you can set a reminder and have a little watch party with anyone else who wants to watch that premiere. So let's get on with it then. I'm going to bring Lance into the mix now. Lance is our uh, documentation manager here at Redis. Hi, Lance. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you. How are you this evening? I'm not bad, thanks. Yeah, it is, it is definitely the evening here. It's the end of my day, but it's the beginning of yours, isn't it? Yes, it is. This is uh, yes. basically the first thing I'm doing in the morning. Which feels very strange to me. I'm still trying to get my head around it. So you're you're definitely fresh and I'm I'm definitely ready to wind down for the weekend, but here we well, are together on this video. I'll be fresher after a few more of these. Yeah, for anyone watching, Lance has got a uh, double T in his mug, so he's uh, he's well prepped up for this uh, for this event here. <laughs> cool. Okay, I'm going to ease you in gently, Lance. So um, we spoke on the panel with Caitlin and Rachel just very briefly about everybody's backgrounds, but now I want to go into a bit more depth just about you. So could you tell me 
about your journey and how you got to where you are now in technical <laughs> writing? Um, well, it's kind of a two-stage thing. Um, right now, I've been focusing on uh, tech writing as my uh, primary uh, day job for a while now. And I got into it because I transitioned from being a developer. However, my journey in the discipline actually started in my first real job out of college, where I went to work for a software company in Silicon Valley. And I joined them in their support department. And then after doing that for a while, there was an opening in documentation. And so I kind of went, oh, hey, let me try this. So I stayed there for a couple of versions and then transitioned into QA. And I was on a track to go into development when um, the executive vice president of the division kind of said, no, actually, I've got a better idea and made me a TPM for special projects. So anyway, by the end of that role, I had sort of had a whirlwind introduction to pretty much the entirety of the software development lifecycle, at least from a commercial perspective. And when I left that company, I became a developer and I brought in all of this background and training and knowledge. So even though I was writing code, I was also doing documentation. I was also doing heavy testing. I was also creating deployment and professional installs. And when we talk about a full stack developer, well, I was sort of the uh, full experience developer. <laughs> Um, so yeah. fast forward a little while and the tools that I was using um, were replaced by other tools. And so I'm like, okay, how can I use this knowledge of development? And I saw that there was an opening for uh, a short-term role at the time uh, at a, a small company called Microsoft. And uh, they got you in. might have heard of them. <laughs> maybe. Uh, <laughs> was hired in uh, ostensibly to work on one project, was immediately reassigned to work on another. And uh, I was brought in as a contractor, which is pretty common for a large organization. And normally at the end of the contract, you know, if they really like you, you get uh, the opportunity to transition into a more full-time role if they have headcount. I was transitioned into an FTE after six weeks. So, um, I did that for about uh, well, close to 10 years and uh, then went on to do uh, other things and uh, all of which has led me to uh, where I am now. Cool. Okay. So it sounds like you heard about the technical writing realm very early in your career, didn't you? Yes. So it was after you graduated, you got the first job and it was as a technical writer. Eventually, if yes. Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, from what I can gather, that's sometimes can be quite unusual because you kind of, I don't know, you, you, you train as a software engineer and then you go into a company and you don't necessarily know about all the different jobs that are available and not all companies have technical writers or documentation teams. So I feel like you were quite lucky to have that early exposure. I don't know how you, if you feel the same oh, yeah. way about that. No, it was a, it was a definite thing. Um, and actually, I, I didn't train to be a computer programmer. I actually graduated with an acting degree. I just had been a, a junior programmer while I was in college and paying the bills. And so by the time I graduated, I had the three to five years, you know, entry level experience. And that was one of the things that made me attractive to the company in California. So just as a sort of an aside then, did you take the acting degree because that's what you were passionate about, but you did the coding job because you were interested, you know, that's where your interests were? Uh, <laughs> well, the college I was that I graduated from didn't have an independent computer science program at the time. So it was bound to the math, uh, to the math program. So you could, if you were going to study computer science, you were already a double major. Uh, I had to basically pay my own way through college, and as I was working through, I uh, took a lot of other classes and found some interests, and I discovered acting. And so by the time I got into this, I ended up being a triple major. Wow. Um, and uh, <laughs> it was kind of expensive, uh, liberal arts college, uh, you know, and my grades were good, but not stellar to get a scholarship. I wasn't into sports. And so a lot of that, I had to have a day job to keep going to school. And so long and short of it is, I ended up at the beginning of what was my uh, senior year with the question of, I can either take the degree that I can get now this year and finish, or I can stay in another year, finish the triple major, 
and end up with twice as much in loans. So uh, practicality won out. I took the degree I could get, figuring that by the time I graduated, I had the three to five years experience needed to get you know, my foot in the door as a tech job. And uh, it turned out that was the case. Yeah. And I think that people that are watching that are in the USA and have been through the USA education system, this probably won't be a surprise to them. They're, they're probably very aware that this is quite a common issue, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Here in the UK, it's completely different. But I think what's really good about listening to your story is that you don't necessarily need to have qualifications in software engineering to be a technical writer. I think it's something that I've definitely taken away from all of the, the chats that I've had with you, Caitlin and Rachel, because you took the acting degree. Yes, you did have experience in software engineering, but that's not necessary. that doesn't necessarily need to be the case, does it? No, and that's quite true. Um, early in my career, I found there were really two kinds of companies, those where that degree made a difference and those where the, the domain knowledge was more important. And as things have gone forward, I've only seen that domain knowledge is certainly more important than um, your educational credentials. You know, if you can uh, put together a website and it has decent performance or something like that, uh, you're fine. People are you know, the biggest thing is people want to know that you're willing to learn, that you're not stuck with your set of tools, that you're flexible and agile. Um, in fact, I actually returned to Microsoft for a second role. And during that interview process, what I uh, learned uh, was that uh, what they look for is uh, what they call a growth mindset. Mm. Meaning, are you open to new things? Are you adept and agile? And, um, you know, or are you one of these people who thinks, well, I know everything? Yeah, that, that, that doesn't go very far, but you know, collaboration yeah. is key, I think. Collaboration is key and the growth mindset is definitely key. The growth mindset is a really good thing to try and have just generally in life. And it's all about, um, the way I kind of sum it up is it's it's about not saying, I can't do that. It's about saying, I can't do that yet. Right. And just being open to to learning or be, believing that you can actually get that skill. So like um, of, uh, Richard Branson there, <laughs> I think that's his name. Yeah, the yeah the British entrepreneur. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to ask you what year this all was, but I know that what you were saying just now is absolutely true. That some companies really do care if you've got the degree; others don't. But nowadays, um, people come into software from all different directions anyway. So mm -hmm. there are boot camps, people are self-taught, you know, there's all these different ways that you can learn the craft of software engineering. So right. it follows that there are all different ways that you can get into tech and then it follows that there are all different ways you can get into technical writing. So what I'm interested in is because you've obviously gone those few steps um, beyond technical writer, now you're managing a team. So how how did you become aware of the career path that was open to you as a technical writer? Like, how did it become clear to you that, you know, this was what you could do and you could progress to become a manager? Well, it was, um, I don't know, it was sort of through osmosis. I mean, you go into a team if you're in a team and, uh, you know, there's obviously somebody who's in charge and, uh, because, uh, when I shifted back to tech writing as a focus for my career, I was at a large company. I was uh, part of a larger organization that was dedicated to um, technical writing. Uh, it was called Content Publishing or CPUB. Um, and, you know, I was one of several dozen writers and there were production people and there were managers and stuff like that. So you go into an enterprise level organization, there's sort of a hierarchy that you learn about. And then once you start thinking about beyond the organization, you learn about similar hierarchies, how they're um, how they operate in different organizations. So, for example, I've also um, had a role at Amazon and Amazon works very differently than Microsoft does. It's more of a collection of startups. And so even though there are many technical writers who work at Amazon corporate, I was the only tech writer on my larger team. So you find over time that uh, there are just as many different ways of um, assembling and paying for and managing a documentation team as there are different organization types. 
but there are some consistent themes. So there's usually, yes, yeah, somebody who's in charge of the team. Um, and there's also specializations. So some people can focus on individual types of writing. Some people can focus on the publication process. That is, how do you take the um, written documents and get them online or however you're going to produce it? There's all sorts of things. Yeah, that's interesting. And what you just said there about Amazon being a collection of startups is, uh, I remember actually one of my friends who worked in Seattle worked for Amazon, but it was a tiny little piece of it. Um, so yeah, th th I remember now that that does totally make sense to me. And I think that, you know, for anyone who's thinking about getting into technical writing, or whatever your background is, if you're not too sure about the career path, then probably uh, the best way is to find a technical writer, uh, or find a company that's got a team and speak to some people there and just see what the structure's like. Because I know what Caitlin, where Caitlin was working when she first started, there was definitely a hierarchy in that team and they had different job titles and they they had a sort of a progression plan and they said right after this number of years you then you'll progress to that so it's probably good to gather a bit of intel and speak to different people if you can find them um and just try and get a just try and map out some some information about what you can gather about how different teams work and then see what the career path might look like for you i think so and I, sorry on, i didn't yeah. mean to interrupt uh, I was going to say one way that you could do that is to find a community of tech writers, such as writethedocs.org. Um, they have a, a series of Slack channels, and uh, they welcome anybody who wants to come in. In fact, they don't say do uh, technical writers. They say documentarians, which I think is a term that came up in one of the earlier conversations. And it's a, it's a very good place to go. Um, and a good way to learn what other people's experiences are, what their job duties are, what the skills are. Um, it's, I think you're right. I think the best thing to do is definitely do your homework, do some investigation, ask some questions. Uh, if you happen to find a project, even if you don't have a local meetup or, you know, for some reason you don't want to go on Slack, there you could look at uh, open source projects that have active documentation and reach out to the writer and say, hey, can I ask you some questions? How does this work? A lot of people I found in the industry and in the discipline are uh, very open to uh, talking shop. And especially in this day and age where we spend most of our time stuck in our homes, being reached out to is a good thing. Yeah, it's, it's always nice when somebody says, you know, I think you're an expert, please teach me about this thing. It, it makes you feel really good. But also I think that because documentation often gets forgotten or it's seen as a nice to have. If you say to a technical writer, please tell me about this, I think a lot of them would be only too happy to spread the word about why it's so good and why you should do it and how to do it. So right. yeah, I agree with you on Write the Docs. Uh, they do have a very busy Slack um, workspace. So if anyone wants to join that, we've put the link in the chat. But also they um, run conferences, don't they, which are very mm -hmm. highly regarded. Yes. And even better, they record the conference and put it up on YouTube so you can watch it after the conference. So you can go back through and find really interesting talks from a few years ago that are still relevant, still interesting, and still very educational. Yeah. And they they run local chapters as well. So the, the conferences, I think, are, um, of course, they're going to be virtual a lot of the time now, but there are a lot of conferences because the local people run them. So I think Portland was a big one. And I think Seattle was another big one um, that I can think of. But yeah, all different countries of the world there. Yeah. Well, I think I, I don't know if there was a conference in Seattle. I think they've had one in Prague. I'm pretty sure they've had one in I don't I want to say Australia or somewhere around that area. Mm. So yeah, it is a worldwide thing. Uh, but it's still very local. And there are definitely but you can see more from the website. I just, yeah, it's a culture that is really open and accepting and uh, very much into sharing and stuff. And uh, that appeals to me very strongly. Yeah, great recommendation. So we talked a little bit about how folks can learn about the career path and things like that. So just thinking about you personally, you've, um, you did some software engineering through college and then you worked for some um, companies and you did software engineering there as well. But how much did you actually know about Redis before you joined Redis? Oh, I knew the name only. 
I didn't even really know much about the uh, the primary use case or how people used it. Uh, and it over the last several months, it's been uh, a, a very interesting um, learning process and uh, seeing how different people uh, approach it and learning how things work. Uh, very enjoy, uh, very much enjoying the experience. There's a lot to learn, and I think that's one of the reasons why I like this gig, uh, or rather the discipline in general, is because there's always something new, and that kind of goes back to that uh, growth mindset. Um, it's, speaking purely for myself, I'm one of those people that believes, you know, we need to continuously learn and continuously try to improve ourselves, because if you don't, well, why are you here? Um, and I try to bring that idea into, you know, the day job or actually whatever it is I'm working on. Yeah. So. Yeah. So you hadn't used Redis and you didn't, you only knew the name. So how did you then get up to speed with it? What was that like? Well, um, just like Caitlin and Rachel both talked about, I had a um, an onboarding plan um, that was put together by uh, my hiring manager, Kyle, whose name has come up a few times, but I don't think we've we actually introduced him fully. He's the uh, director of education at Redis. And so he's in charge of the developer relations, which is your team. And he's also in charge of do documentation ultimately, which is my team. And uh, Redis decided to make a commitment to uh, documentation and I was the first person hired on to help uh, extend that commitment and make it to turn it into reality. Kyle had a very extensive onboarding plan, and uh, it's included in part, yes, learning to just install the product and go through some <laughs> tutorials and stuff like that. But it was also trial by fire of, okay, here are some tickets. Uh, we need some things changed. We need to make some updates. And so it's been very much a... Um, um a learn while you work kind of thing um and it, that's exciting it's a little scary but it's also exciting uh, it's not the first time i've done that i whenever i start a new role i find that there's always something new to learn and so i very rarely start a role where i'm already a subject matter expert and sometimes i have to stop myself and go okay that's not how that used to work how does it work today <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah I think most people when they change jobs there's always something new to learn and I think there's no shame in taking a new job that you know exactly how to do inside out but a lot of people are taking jobs where they don't know um, everything about that role um, when they join and I think that you know in your first few months in any role if you've got a good manager then they'll be very understanding about the fact that you need time to get used to it. And it's a very kind of safe space to, to make mistakes, isn't it? A very supportive kind of space to make mistakes. Um, and I think that people that are watching who, we're gonna have a mixture of folks that are watching, but any of you who are watching who are software engineers already should be quite accustomed to the whole, like I've got to learn this new thing today because that's what software is like. And it's very hard to survive in the software engineering world if you don't do that. So in that respect, you know, the two disciplines are quite similar, I would suggest. So you, when we did the panel um, fireside, I asked everybody, how do you describe what you do to folks that aren't in tech? So for example, your cousins or you know members of your family or your next door neighbor or your friends and you described it as i teach redis so how would you compare and contrast or how is it sort of the same and different from the other technologies that you've worked on how is how is the way that you have to teach redis the same or different to those previous roles that you've had well, in some to, to some degree, that's an interesting question. Um, to some degree, it's very similar. I mean, in my role at Amazon, I was writing content uh, about internationalization. So my logline on that was I teach developers how to write internationalizable software, software that can be used throughout the world and that presents itself at, in the way that people expect it to. When I worked at Microsoft, I did a lot of work with um, Internet Explorer. So uh, I worked on developer content, 
So I described that as I teach people how to create websites because that was really the focus of our team is here's what IE supports, here's how to use it effectively on your website, and here's how to create websites that are responsive and can be used by any browser. Um, some of the other technologies, I've kind of used the same sort of thing. It's basically um, what is the purpose of the technology and um, how do I help people learn how to use it? To me, documentation is designed to solve customer problems. And so whenever I start in on, okay, this is my new gig or my new project or my new responsibility, it's a question of what is it that people want to do with this? And do we do a good job now of teaching them how to do it? If not, those are the gaps that I can start filling right away, especially since I'm probably going through the same set of experiences. Yeah, yeah. And that brings me very nicely onto my next question. Um, <laughs> because you have got a set of like Lance's rules for documentarian life and documentarian life. Oh, sorry. Documentarian is a word that I used the other day, but I wasn't too sure whether it was a real word. So I'm really glad you said that earlier because, uh, <laughs> see, because you're the expert here. But yeah, you've got your, your, you've got your tenets for, uh, for document writing. And one of them is about single intent. So tell us a little bit more about that. Okay. Um, well, one of the things that I try to do is, um, this is something that I learned again at Microsoft. Uh, it's something that I've seen echoed by other companies, but each piece of writing uh, is supposed to do just one thing and one thing only. Uh, I think we can all think of cases where we've gotten to a, a resource and we're like, what is this trying to teach me? I can't find my answer. I don't know what is going on here. And you sort of, if you're reading it, you're kind of like, does this person even know what they're trying to say? Although normally we say that, does this person even know what they're talking about? Ultimately, you know, you, you get in there, you read something, you're like, this person doesn't know what it is they want to write. So one of the ways that we focus that, there's another question that comes along that is, how do I know when I'm done? You know, mm. when are you done with your the, the article that you're working on or the piece that you're working on? And that's where the intent comes in. Now, those with a product management background will recognize the term epic from modern use. And that is usually expressed as a role and a problem. As a developer, I want to deploy Redis. Now, right there, simple sentence. That's your intent. And if you're sitting there and somebody's giving you a piece of feedback, oh, we really need to include this, this, and this, you can go, well, does that contribute to the intent or does it distract from it? That's not, we're not going to document that. It's just more of, we're not going to document that here. And then we find an appropriate place to document that. And we link the two. Modern, uh, in, in modern tech writing, we work really hard to help people find what they want to do as quickly as possible. Ideally, I would prefer the, to have documentation that is a bit like the Hollywood uh, understanding of the gentleman's gentleman. Think of Anthony Hopkins in such a role. You know, he's sort of like there, he's got his little tray, they do the bit, and the person's like, oh, wait, that was exactly, wait, where'd he go? In other words, you know, they're sort of there only as long as they need to be, and they're in the background and out of the picture. And that's sort of what I want documentation to be is, of course, I found it in the docs. It was right here. It's no big deal. So that people take it for granted. Now, in practice, it's incredibly hard to achieve. It takes a lot of design. It takes a lot of understanding. And it takes some time and iteration. So uh, there's a lot of um, creativity, analysis, judgment, evaluation. It's not just all banging on a keyboard. Yeah, yeah. Does and like, that answer your question? It does, definitely. And it, <laughs> it harks back to what you said in the, the panel about how it's not just about writing, it's about design and all these other different things that you have to kind of weave into the mix. Because, right. you know, a lot of people can string a sentence together, but can you put that together in a coherent set of steps that somebody else who's never seen this before and never used a technology before um, come out, use those steps and come out with the same outcome as everybody else using that same set of steps about barring any sort of technical issues on their local machine or anything like that. But I really love how you said about if you have a single intent, then you know when you're done. You know what success looks like, don't you? And that's mm -hmm. really important for any piece of work, isn't it? Yes. And you, you kind of have to go into 
stuff with thinking about, you know, what does success look like? Okay, yeah, you can do something tactical and see if it works, but you do kind of have to think about why are we doing this and how are we going to measure whether it was good enough? So, um, yeah, that makes... There's also another advantage. Um, When I was at Microsoft during my second role, the intent was part of what we called a peer review process. We would have a piece of work and we would have other writers across the team. They would volunteer. We'd sit down. They'd read it. And one of the first questions they would ask is, does this, as written, meet its intent? And so the intent is not just a tool for you. It's also a tool to communicate to your stakeholders, your reviewers, and other people to go, okay, this is what we're trying to accomplish. And so it's really a framing device. And it's very useful because it avo- it helps avoid situations like, well, I think the document needs to do this. And we're like, yeah, sir, this is a Wendy's. Um, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think if folks want to get into documentation or technical writing or you just want to improve your writing in general, I think it's a good thing to start practicing, actually. I do. Have a look, yes. at, have a look at an email that you've written recently is it clear what your intent is? You know, you don't have to have one intent for the whole email, maybe for each paragraph, for each distinct block. So Mm -hmm. in your world, the distinct block would be that piece of documentation. In an email, it might be that distinct block is a paragraph. It might be good to start practicing that and really kind of getting that focus because Mm -hmm. that's what you need. People these days don't have a very long attention span. They get frustrated quickly. If they don't get the answer very fast, they move on to... The next thing so you need to be able to to meet the need that that person's got but also make it clear the need that you're trying to fulfill and what something that reminds of something that i remembered while you were speaking was um about the single intent thing was in software engineering <laughs> somebody was uh, doing a talk about git and they were saying you know if you're committing and you're finding that your commit message is quite long and it's got a lot of ands in or it's got a lot of commas in you probably need <laughs> to split that out into separate commits and that's what it reminded me of when you said about the single intent if you've got too many things going on you probably need to split that document up into different yes. documents and have them all fulfill a different need so uh, so yeah i can see that there's kind of some linkages there and that kind of echoes up to one of the questions you asked during the uh, joint fireside chat. Um, is that I just lost it? <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, uh, I'll come back to you. Brain fade. Um, sorry, I had something and it just disappeared. Oh, I'm that sorry. happens. Don't worry, it will come back. If it comes back, just more stop coffee. me and just just I must shout. Have more coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if it comes back, just shout. I, I won't be offended, but. Um, one of the other tenets that you've got, one of Lance's other rules for documentarian life, I really love the fact that you're on my team because I need you to, to, to educate me about this. You, we don't need to be perfect to publish. And to me, my, I'm starting to feel a, some kind of pain here when you say we don't need to be perfect to publish because I am very much a perfectionist. So talk to me about that. Oh, um, well... It used to be that tech writing was all bound into books and, you know, you'd put it on the shelf and you couldn't fix it. Now that we're all on the web and that's our primary mechanism, whether or not we put it, make it public, um, we're continuously publishing. And so the, um, the great thing about that is you don't have to make sure that it's perfect because it's going to have ink on it and be on a shelf for 20, 30 years or what have you. It's like, oh, there's a typo. Okay, let's just check in the fix and boom, magic. No typo. See, now we just have to wait for Google to pick it up and, you know, hopefully all of the evidence will be swept away. Um, we're constantly updating the content. We operate in an agile mindset, meaning we do as much as we know we need to do now. Um, and that's incredibly liberating because it means that you can get the immediate job done without having to stress about, yeah, but should we, oh, well, we need to do some testing. It's like, okay, do the bit you can do, do the testing to figure out the next bit, add another ticket, come back to it later. Meanwhile, while all that's going on, you've got two, three, four, five, six more tickets you've been able to burn through. So yeah. it's a very agile environment. And um, I remembered the thing that I suddenly spaced on is that uh, one of the big changes recently, and this is something we touched on earlier, is that people no longer read for depth. 
you know, because mm. we're always consuming content on our phones or in email or on screens, we're always looking at some sort of a screen to read now. So people no longer go deep dive into it. Um, it's just sort of like you're evaluating your search results. Is this the one? Is this the one? Is this the one? And that's, again, where the intent helps is because if you focus your intent, you know up front what to put in there so that people can go, is this what I'm looking for or do I need to move on? So it's a very handy framing device all around. Yeah. With that in mind, then, do you have to bear in mind search engine optimization when you're yes. doing your role? Right. Yes. Is there anything you can tell us about how you do that? And it's a really big topic. It is a really big topic, but it's also if you do the basics, you're pretty much 80 some odd percent there. Um, it, when you're creating a, do, uh, a document, you really want to have consistency. And so you have unity with your title, with your file names, with your headings, and with your first uh, opening paragraph. And in fact, um, I know there's a lot of sites that talk about, oh, here's how you can trick yourself into a better thing. Uh, Google's gotten a little wise to that. Bing sort of picked up the same sort of thing, DuckDuckGo, et cetera. If you really want your con content to place well, write content that is focused on what intent the users have when they're reading content. So again, we echo back to the intent. If you want to have a document that shows how to deploy Redis, for example, you want to make sure that your H1, you only have one H1, and it includes deploy Redis, your file name, deploy Redis, your opening paragraph has that expression in it. And in all of those things, they contribute well to a higher placement. I, I have found that if, if you do that, you will get, if not at the top hit, if not the lucky hit, you will at least be in the top five or six. So I know there's ways that you can do that. You can try keywords and all the rest of it. I'd say first, before you try manipulating the rules a little bit, you know, blowing on the dice or whatever, just try playing it straight and see how well you do there. And if you have other people coming up, take a look and say, why are they beating me out on this? What is it in their content that's not in mine? And then revise your content using the whole continuous publishing thing. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, before you start trying to do any sort of wizardry, just look at the logical situation. What do people? What are people probably googling if they yep. want to get to this document? Well, they right. want to know how to deploy Redis. So let's say how to deploy Redis or something like that. Um, right. Yeah. You know, you yeah. might have designed the document to say how to install Redis, and if most of the people don't think of install as the keyword, then they'll never be typing that in. So that sort mm -hmm. of homework. How did you get here? Those sort of that sort of, those sort of analytics that tell you all of that, or where did they go? You know, you can get some insights from that. But by and large, the easiest thing to do is start with the intent, stay incredibly focused on that, and then support it with other stuff. Mm, yeah, completely. And I I love what you said there. I'm glad that you remembered what you wanted to say about uh, what what was it? Something about people reading for. Nobody they reads don't read depth anymore. Depth. Yeah, right. yeah. And the the probably that one of the worst manifestations of this is the fact that people will just repeat everything that they see on Facebook, yeah. and the, so that very much proves the fact that people don't do any deep thinking or deep um, reading. It's not even that they're reading the article; they're reacting to the click uh, the headline. I was yeah, say clickbait, but exactly. And well, yes, I was going to say that as well. There's so many headlines that are that are designed for you to click on that are very sensationalist and don't capture the truth, the whole truth of the situation. So if yeah. that's all people are reading, then that's what we as documentarians need to focus on. But um, yeah, yeah you kind of find with all this. not um, entirely of the virtue that it used to be. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> completely. So, uh, so that brings me on to the third tenet that I, uh, that I really loved of, of your, your, uh, your rules for documentarian life. And by the way, uh, Lance doesn't call them this. I've named it that. Well, actually, I did call them this because they come from my experiences at Amazon. Um, as part of, you know, Amazon is well known for their uh, writing process. And one of the parts of that is every project has what they call a set of tenants 
that you use to help make decisions that haven't already been made. So whenever you work on a project, there's these questions of, well, how do we do this? What's the rule, et cetera, and so on. The tenants help shape that. Now, they're flexible, and so it, uh, as part of the ritual of creating tenants for your project, that's one of the things you're expected to create as part of this ritual is you always end the tenants of, okay, here are our tenants, and then there's a subhead that says, unless you know of better ones, which means that what they're basically saying is, this is our current understanding, this is what we're working toward, and if there's something we should be doing better, let us know. There's an implied um, request for feedback with that. So... Yeah, tenants is a loaded word, and uh, I'm not trying to use Amazonian business writing in our Redis documentation, but I have uh, sort of recycled some of the best ideas that I learned and tried to incorporate them and use that as a framing device to have other conversations that as a writing team, I feel we should have. Yeah, um, yeah, and it's all just part like of I was, mindset. Yeah, just like the um, intent came from my experiences at Microsoft and now you know, it's just sort of like a reflection of uh, a reflection through the lenses of my own experiences, unless people know of better ones. Yeah. And I think that working from best practice is always a good place to start. Yeah. So which is and what you're doing. Essentially, yeah. it's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we're, we're all striving to do that. So, um, so thinking about what you said just now about, um, People don't read for depth anymore. And, you know, this is the, another tenet, the, the last tenet I want to talk to you about today. Um, one of your tenets is right for a modern audience. So yes. tell us a bit about that. That also uh, originated from uh, my experiences with Microsoft. There's actually five voice, and five voice and tone principles that we followed at that point. The first one is the intent. Um, there's three of, three of the other ones are be brief. Um, use everyday language, avoid jargon. Um, you know, people, technical writing came out of academic writing and academic writing has a definite process for what's expected, especially in your formal papers, et cetera. You know, you have your abstract, you have your introduction, and this is what I'm going to tell you, what I, want to, what I want to tell you. You have your body where you come in there and you have your sections telling everything, and then you have your conclusion where you summarize, this is what I told you. People don't read that anymore. Today, it's very journalistic. It's very newsy. It's very like, okay, I'm opening the paper. I've got 10, I, I've got like two minutes to get a sense of the day. So they're not they're looking at the leads, or worse, they're looking at the headlines. And while hardly anyone reads a paper anymore, we see that same behavior going on, like you say, in Facebook and Twitter, social media. You know, people are just scanning the headline and reacting, whether or not the article actually supports the headline. So what we do as documentarians is we, okay, we understand how people interact with our docs, and we write accordingly. So we try to avoid industry language jargon. Uh, because somebody uh, going back is everybody's learning. Somebody might be reading the doc that may not understand that when you say ingest, you're not talking about eating, you're actually talking about importing. Yeah. Um, you know, the other thing is, is that a lot of readers don't speak English as their native language. And so using staying with the, the, the example ingest, they might not realize they would get really confused and hung up. Wait, what does this have to do with food? I'm confused. This is supposed to be about video. What? Um, all of that stuff leads up to a word you've used a lot, friction, which is also a concept that Amazon uses in one of their designs is they try to remove friction from the experience. And one of the things I've long tried to do with my work is look at documentation in part, not only as the tactical article, but also as the strategic experience that a person is going through. And so how can I remove friction from that? How can I make documentation easier to use? Whether that's adding a bunch of screenshots, whether that's flattening the table of contents, whether that's reorganizing and getting rid of a bunch of stuff that is really outside of the intent. It's a question of, this is the first time you're seeing this. Is it successful? And if not, how can we improve it? And also, how can we improve it incrementally? In other words, okay, this might be the way we would do it if we had all the time in the world, which we don't. So how do we prioritize those changes? What can we do quickly and tactically? And so we can make 
incremental improvements continuously over time, it gets better. Or so we hope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because we don't have to be perfect to publish, do we? We can no, make we don't. those little changes and uh, and just know that we've got that that north star, that direction that we're going in. But we we just do it in in bits. So yeah, so we talked about the tenets. We've talked about a little bit about style. What and you were hired into Redis um, as the first person in the current team, and so you've now built that team up a bit. What other processes? Do you need to set up when you're putting together a docs team? I'm thinking there's probably like QA and like sort of demand management type stuff that all goes with the the joys of team leading, isn't mm -hmm. there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot of that. Uh, at the basics, you really need first off to how do you track the work that needs to get done, and how do you make sure that the work is getting done? How do you make sure that the work that's being done is matching the intent? Um, and how do you ensure quality? So uh, there are so certain processes. We're a small team, so both um, Kyle and I really don't enjoy having over-engineered processes. We want to have just the amount of process that we need and no more. Because remember that process exists to keep you to help you avoid making common mistakes. Yeah. There's sort of guardrails, a safety net, so to speak. And so if part of your QA process is, well, check links before you make them public so that there's no 404s, and you keep finding that 404 is showing up, then you have to stop and say, okay, what's not working? How did this come through? And that's where you come back to uh, sort of the uh, postmortem process that you'll sometimes hear about from product management. You can do postmortems in very small ways of saying, oh, how did that happen? Where did we go wrong, et cetera? And when you identify those, then you're saying, OK, so how can we add another little guardrail just to sort of catch us before we make that mistake again? Um, and that's sort of, I like the processes. I like to design processes that are organic because I have found that those are the ones that you're most, most likely to remember and therefore to actually follow. Mm. Um, I've been in environments where there's highly structured and you've got this checklist of things and nobody wants to do it because it's such a pain in that tail feathers. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> I don't want that stuff. Um, I would rather have something like going, well, did you check, did you click the links in the article first before you pushed, you know, after it got pushed to staging? Okay, I'll do that next time. Um, you know. <laughs> or what have you. The other thing is to, to also look for people who have a natural affinity for just um, making sure. Uh, Rachel's very good at this. She, uh, she's not officially an editor, but she functions as one in some ways because she's very good at spotting typos and other little glitches and things like that. And so I have a tendency to make a bunch of typos, hence the uh, Twitter handle. <laughs> yeah. um, but, so it's it's very helpful to have her um, eagle eye, uh, just making sure of things um, before customers see that. Um, in the same way, over time, as the team develops and grows, you sort of start to sense pain points. And once that gets in there, say, hey, Let's try to do X to address this now while it's small and the asteroid's far away and we can nudge it away aside instead of having to send somebody up there to blow it up. Um, sorry, I make a lot of pop cultural references. Sorry. <laughs> this is me. Well, I think we can all envisage what would happen if you didn't do that. So, yeah. Um, so I try really hard not to add a lot of process. Um, but when we hired uh, Caitlin, for example, she had a lot of background with Jira. Now, I've used Jira off and on, so I know it uh, as a user, but she's been an administrator before. So she was like, okay, so you are a Jira expert, and you are now in charge of Jira. And, you know, that's been fine. Um, we had a little bit of uh, sort of like, well, what does that mean? How do we work this through? How do we want to work it? I like to have things that are an ongoing feedback process that's, oh, well, okay, this isn't quite working. Let's tweak this now and then smooth that friction and then it doesn't become a problem. So 
going back to, you know, how do I identify things? You know, when there's grit in the system, when there's friction being added. Yeah. And so buffing that out early, it's easy. No egos are involved. Quick, done, moving on. Otherwise, everything's going to seize up, isn't it, eventually? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you touched a little bit there on um, various skills that the different members of the team bring to the party that complement each other. And sometimes that's a bit of a happy coincidence, isn't it? Um, because you don't necessarily know about this at the point at which you're recruiting them. You know, when you are you put out the advert and you say what you want these people to have, um, then it's a, a, a set of requirements that are essential, a set of requirements that are nice to have. Um, and then, you know, people always bring extra things to the party that you may not necessarily have specified. But there must be some um, skills that are that are specific to this type of role that you really need people to bring that you can't teach them. Because there are a lot of things you can teach them. Like you can say, right, okay, this is how you learn about Redis. Here's some good um, training materials, um, some good workshops, and you know, some good videos to watch. You can learn about Redis. But there must be some things that you can't teach that you really need people to have as a minimum to be a technical writer. What would you say about that? I'd say there's different classes of those kinds of skills. I mean, obviously, you'll need some sort of a facility with the language, uh, knowing the difference, uh, you know, between nouns and verbs and how to string them together. That's a, that's that's helpful. Um, it's, uh, but by the same token, knowing why people would prefer a serial comma to not, um, you know, so you can have that conversation that we had separately. <laughs> <laughs> is that's an Oxford comma, right? Uh, no, that's no. You need the serial comma. We, we no, both Kyle is, and is, I agree on that pretty strongly. Um, is that also known as the Oxford comma, though? It is. Just for folks who aren't familiar with that term, yeah, because I know it as an Oxford comma, right. something that I avoid. But yes, um, <laughs> it's well, it's funny a, because a uh, during my uh, during my uh, second interview series at Microsoft, I had one of the interviewers ask me why. And I just shot back instantly because uh, because clarity is always preferred to ambiguity. And that was the end of that entire conversation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just for folks who don't know what a serial, also known as an Oxford comma are, is when you've got a list of things and then the, the last thing is preceded by and. It's whether or not you put a comma before that and. Um, it, and if you, yeah, go on. Well, the one of the classic um, examples of that is the sentence that ends with, I'd like to thank my parents, Albert Einstein and Mother Teresa. Yeah. You, if you put a comma <laughs> after knew? my parents, uh, but you don't put one after Einstein, then, oh, wait, Einstein and Mother Teresa were your parents? Uh, yeah. So Who knew? sometimes it's Are just you? easiest. Let it hit but first, everybody. <laughs> getting, yeah, really. Uh, getting back to, to your question, um, there is a musicality to writing. And that's not something that I think can be taught. So one of the things that I look for uh, when we're evaluating um, candidates is to look at these uh, samples that they've written and to see if I can just, if I can from the sample, if not necessarily see the musicality, at least see the thought that has structured something in a way that is like a classic argument. In other words, here's my beginning, here's what I want to do, and here's where I want to end up, and whether or not they follow through with it. All technical writing is a narrative. It's a story. How well do you tell the story? And there are some people who are really good at telling a story. There are some people who need to learn the mechanics of how to tell a story better. And there are some people who just can't tell stories at all. That becomes evident in the samples. I can teach people how to become better storytellers. I can teach them or actually insist that they include the serial comma, but I can't <laughs> teach them the music. I can't teach them to understand the, to make the editorial decisions of, okay, here's what we need and no more to serve the intent. Um, and that becomes super clear. Um, yeah. Yeah. I keep going, yeah. But I'll just no. Stop. Yeah, that's no, that's good. Thanks for that. Because I knew for, for any job, really, there's always something that people have got to bring that you can't teach or that you need them to be able to hit the ground running on. And you can teach them all the other bits. Um, and we can be very forgiving with here are the nice to haves as long as you have these. So it's, it's really good, I think, for anyone who 
wants to get into the realm of technical writing to know what that is. And I think the answer is practice, read things that you think are good at technical writing and kind of analyze them and pick them apart and, and see what you think. So we're coming. Yeah, yeah actually, I want to follow up on one thought on that is that yeah. um, it is part of practice, give yourself assignments, you know, basically pick something that's of interest to you, even if it's something as simple of here's how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Mm. And then go ahead and try it out. There's a bunch of videos on uh, YouTube about, uh, you know, there's one in particular I'm thinking of a dad and his children have done this exercise and he's reading what they, the instructions they've written and oh, hilarity yeah. ensues. But the same sort of thing, um, you can do that for yourself. Uh, when I was uh, looking for roles after I left Microsoft, I couldn't use a lot of my writing that I had done there. So I went, okay, what's an article that I can write over the course of a weekend or two and really work on to showcase my skills? And so I did that, and that became the first of a couple of portfolio pieces. There's a lot of simple things that you can do to demonstrate facility. I can teach mechanics, but I can't teach passion. And so mm. echoing back to um, the question that you asked about, you know, what are some of the things I look for? One thing I look for is curiosity. That's the basis of your growth mindset right there. The ability to, com the, the desire to communicate and the um, ability to, uh, or the uh, curiosity to go out and say, how do I do this better? How do I find the simplest way to do this? And did I make good choices while putting that together? We could argue about the individual choices. I'm less worried about that. But I do want to see that basic ability. Yeah. And it's something that both Caitlin and Rachel had mentioned, um, the skills that they have personally brought to the technical writing roles that they have had and currently yeah. have. One of the big ones was research. Yes. So that um, kind of goes along with I just got to say, we're very piece. lucky to have both of them on the team. Um, they make my job so much easier. Yeah, yeah, they're great. They're brilliant. So last question, then this, this hour has finished really fast, actually. Oh, wow. So the last, yeah, the last question I want to ask you, um, and it's kind of linked to the last question I asked you on the panel. So on the panel, I said to you, how have you seen technical writing change over the last insert arbitrary period of time here? I said five to 10 years, but you know, because text changed quite a lot in the recent past because it changes very quickly. Um, and now today I wanna ask you, how are you seeing the realm of technical writing changing now and where do you see it going in the near future? I think we're starting to explore different ways of providing documentation. I think we're in the early days of different types of experiences. I think uh, there's a lot of room to come up with um, non-traditional ways of teaching, and there's uh, a lot of opportunity there. I don't think we're entirely there yet on some of the technology. Uh, it's still Video is still really expensive and really brittle and hard to update. There's techniques, techniques that you can follow to make that easier, of course, um, as with any technology. So things are getting better. But right now, it still is about uh, a set of content, uh, pretty much an article form that's organized. I think search will get better. I think the connections and the A's of connecting disparate sources will get better. Um, I don't know. It's, it's information, knowledge, and management and architecture. And we're still in the bearskins and stone knives era of, of that. I think fast forward 50 years, the way people will think of documentation then will be as different as the way people think of programming today uh, compared to what how they thought about it in the 60s when the original Star Trek aired. <laughs> I knew you were going to get Star Trek in here somewhere. Well done. Sneaked it in <laughs> right at the end. Well done. <laughs> Thanks Made so much. By that much. Oh, yeah. Oh, I I managed to stop it right till the end. Oh, I feel so disappointed in myself. Never mind. No, thanks so much, Lance, for spending uh, this time with me today. I have learned so much from you. It's, Thank yeah. You. I try to make everything, I try to make all of the different firesides a bit different because I don't want folks to watch them and think, oh, they've already said that. Um, and I really wanted to dive in with you. At, with into the whole management piece and the more strategic stuff 
and yeah I think we really did that today so yeah thanks so much for sharing your uh, infinite knowledge and wisdom with me well I don't know about infinite but thank you I enjoyed the opportunity no worries so um that was the last in our hacktoberfest technical writing explained series i really hope you enjoyed it you can see all of the recordings on our youtube channel and the recording of this here twitch live stream will be on youtube very soon if you subscribe to our youtube channel you'll get a notification when the video has been uploaded and we will most likely do a youtube premiere on that as well so you can set a reminder to uh to be the first to know when it actually gets released to the entire world. How exciting is that? So yeah, the next time you'll see me on the live streams is on Thursday next week. If any of you are doing RU 101, Introduction to Redis Data Structures, which is a Redis University course, I will be continuing my live streaming of learning that in public on Thursday next week. And um, yeah, as for Hacktoberfest, you still got another two days to get contributing. So please do check out our Hacktoberfest at Redis page at developer.redis.com slash Hacktoberfest. It remains for me to say, have a great rest of your October. Have a brilliant weekend. Look after yourselves until I see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye.